Income tax 2022-2023. Are you self-employed? Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. Lloyd, let's do some wealth preservation with some tax preparation. Most of this information comes from the tax guide for small business for individuals who use Schedule C, publication 334, tax year 2022. You can find it on the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, we're focused on line one, that being income, remembering that the first half of the income tax formula is in essence an income statement, although a strange one. We also want to note that this is basically a skeleton format that we can easily visualize and a lot of other information would be feeding into it from other forms and schedules. This basically representing the first page of the form 1040 where we have an income statement type format starting with the income section. Then we have the adjustments to income which you could call above the line deductions similar to expenses if it was an income statement terminology gets us to the subtotal of adjusted gross income agi and important subtotal because when we look at phase outs for example as income levels rise of credits and of deductions they're usually based on this subtotal adjusted gross income agi rather than the income line then we have the greater of the standard deduction or itemized deductions. You could think of these as similar to expenses. Again, we're gonna take the greater of these two. You could call these the below the line deductions. Is tax deductible? I know. Gets us to the taxable income, which is in essence equivalent to net income in a normal type of income statement. Everything's flipped on its head where we want the taxable income to be as low as possible as opposed to normal income statements in normal situations where we want the net income to be as high as possible. That means we would like to be able to exclude income if possible, if legally possible up top. And we would like to have our deductions, which are kind of similar to expenses, as high as possible. Now note, we're back up here on the income line when we're thinking about the formula with regards to what's being reflected on page one of the form 1040. However, we're gonna feed into that now the business income and the business income is gonna come from another schedule. The typical schedule and the one we're focused on here is for small businesses, that being the Schedule C. Now the Schedule C is gonna be a whole nother income statement and an income statement that is much more uh, what we're used to seeing in terms of an income statement. In other words, we're gonna have a Schedule C which will have income from the business, expenses from the business, the expenses are still in essence deductions, but they're kind of normal and natural deductions that we would expect from an income tax system. In other words, if you have an income tax system, you would expect that the deductions would be those things that you needed to consume in order to generate revenue so that you tax people on the net income, not on their gross income. If you tax people on their gross income, then you're gonna be favoring some industries versus other industries and the, the one industries that need more uh, more investment, more expenditures in order to generate the revenue are gonna be disincentivized, right? So that's the general idea. And that actually makes good sense when we think about the Schedule C. So it's the net income from the Schedule C that flows into the income line on the Form 1040. So that's a little bit confusing because this income line then already is including a bunch of expenses when pulling in something from a Schedule C type of business because you're pulling in the bottom line of an income statement, which was the income minus the expenses, the expenses being the business deductions. Now, when you don't have business income, the other income on this top line usually comes from like W-2 income. And the idea with a W-2 income is we don't have those other kind of expenses because the employer is thought to be the one that's going to be 
uh, laying out those types of expenditures. Therefore, most of these deductions on the actual form 1040, the adjustments to income and the itemized deductions aren't really like natural expenses to that we would think of for an, an income tax type of system. There are expenses that are trying to change our behavior or incentivize certain things, stimulate the economy, whatever they're trying to do. But actually the Schedule C is, is more straightforward in that the expenses that are there uh, make sense to us from a normal kind of income statement or tax income tax type of system. But the net income is going to flow into this formula. It's the bottom line. So when we're looking at then the first page of the form 1040, we're focused here on other income from Schedule 1. This is where the Schedule C is flowing into the first page of the 1040, which we can kind of visualize in this formula format. And this number then that's flowing in from the Schedule C is the net income, which has already been decreased by the business deductions. Now that came from the Schedule C where we had income of 120 minus expenses, which you can't see here was 20,000. The net income is what pulled into the first page of the Form 1040 on the income section of the Form 1040. Okay, are you self-employed? Answer, you are a self-employed person if you carry on a trade or business as a sole proprietor or an independent contractor. Usually this is a fairly straightforward situation, but there are areas where it can be less straightforward and people often have questions as to whether they're self-employed or not and what the tax consequences would then be. Let's first take a step back and think about the IRS's perspective with regards to your revenue. From the IRS's perspective, anything that we receive should be basically classified as revenue unless the IRS code has exempted it from income. And remember that reporting it as income is bad for taxes because that means in an income tax system, we're gonna be paying tax on it. Now the IRS has a perspective to kind of look over everybody's shoulder to try to determine if people are reporting their income or not. And if you think about most transactions, you have a payer of the transaction and then you have the recipient in the transaction. So someone has income and the other one has a deduction. From the tax perspective, the deduction is good and the income is bad. Everything's flipped on its head, right? So in, for example, an employee-employer situation, which most of us have been in at some point or another, we might have W-2 income that we're receiving from the employer. The IRS actually has leverage on the employer in that situation to give the IRS information about the person that they're paying. Why? because the employer wants to get a deduction for the wages that they're paying to the employee. The employee has an incentive not to report their income. They should report their income, but that's where the IRS is gonna be skeptical that the employee is not gonna report their income. So they basically force the payer, in that situation, the employer, to give the W-2, not only to the employee, but also to the government, so that the government knows how much the employee pay earned and they force the employer to be the government's tax collector, taking the money out of the paycheck before the employee even uh, receives it. So you can see how the, so the situation is gonna work there. Now, if you are self-employed type of situation, the government doesn't have the same kind of leverage in an employee-employer situation, although they still could have some leverage because if you're a sole proprietor that's working for another business instead of individuals, then that business still wants to take a business deduction. Although you're not an employee, you, you uh, still are getting paid. And so the IRS could say, hey, look, if you want that expense to the person that's paying you as a sole proprietor, we want you to tell us the money that you're paying, not with a W-2, we won't force you to take the withholdings, but with a form 1099. So if you're a sole proprietor, then you might get these 1099 forms, which would indicate that you would have to report as income. But remember, the fact that we got a W-2 form or a 1099 form does not necessarily mean that we would have to record income or not record income. Those are just gonna be informational forms. The IRS is kind of trying to look over our shoulders. And oftentimes because of those informational forms, because of the intrusive nature of the IRS trying to get more and more information about people's revenue,
we start to think that we don't have to record income unless we get a form like a 1099 or a W-2. And that's the kind of what I'm trying to drive at here. That shouldn't be the thing that tells us whether or not we have to report income or not. That's the thing that the IRS is using to double check that we report income. So for example, if you're in a type of business where you're not working for another business, you're working for the end consumer, an individual, like someone that, that is an, a hair salon or a massage parlor or a restaurant, now you're dealing with people that don't have business expenses. So they're not gonna issue you a 1099 because the IRS is not pressuring the individual. The IRS has no leverage over someone getting their hair cut to, to have them give the person who cut their hair a 1099 form because I don't get a deduction for getting my hair cut, right? Does that mean that the person that got the money doesn't have to record income? No, no, it doesn't. You still have a sole proprietorship and you still should be reporting the income for tax purposes, but it does mean that you're less likely to have that, that informational form telling you, such as a W-2 form or a 1099 form telling you that you have to record income. So I think that's where a lot of people get confused when they go from a W-2 situation to a sole proprietor situation. You can also imagine situations where people go from a W-2 situation to also picking up gig work. So now they're doing gig work on the side and they might think this is just a side thing. It's not actually my job. I still have a W-2 job, but obviously from the IRS's perspective, they're gonna want some of that gig money as well. They see that as a business and they're gonna want you know some of that money and you can understand that. The other thing that gets kind of fuzzy sometimes is when you have a a hobby so a classic case was was when they had uh horse racing people like to buy horses right and have them have horse racing but it was pretty clear that they were losing money all the time on these horse races and it was more of a hobby it was a very expensive hobby but they were losing money so if they reported a schedule c business they actually had losses and the IRS wants a piece of your earnings. They don't want a piece of your losses. They want you to make money and then the IRS takes some of it. They don't want to take on the risk of a loss and then, and then compensate you for the losses. So if you have a business with a loss, the IRS is going to be skeptical that it's not a business, but a hobby. And so therefore they're, they're actually may restrict you from recording it as business income, but rather hobby income so that they possibly can still get a bit of the income without without you reporting a loss now if you do have a loss and it's a legitimate business don't be afraid of reporting a loss if it's a legitimate business loss we'll get into that later but the hobby versus a business is another area where people often uh, get confused also just note that uh, the iris tries to make a delineated line between someone being an employee and someone being a uh, a contractor or a non-employee situation. So that's another gray area that can happen. Now, there's not always a, a set line. You can try to come up with some with ideas of when someone is an employee versus when they're a contractor, but you may have some situations where you can decide whether to be an employee or a contractor because you're kind of you're you're not you're not in one category or the other specifically. And you might be in a situation where you want to ask yourself, do I want to be a sole proprietor? Or do I want to be a W-2 employee and situate yourself in one of those two areas? There's pros and cons to either one. When you're hiring other people, you have the same question. Do I want to hire them as an employee? Do I want to hire them as a contractor? Do I want to take someone on as an equity partner kind of situation? So we'll dive into some of those more questions in future presentations. But caution, you do not have to carry on uh, regular full-time business activities to be self-employed. In other words, you can have a side job. You could just be doing some gig work. And yes, the IRS wants their share of your money, whether you get a 1099 or not. Right? Having a part-time business in addition to your regular job or business may be self-employment. So trade or business. A trade or business is generally an activity carried on to make a profit. So this often comes up with that fuzzy question of, is it a hobby versus is it a business? If you're in business to make a profit, then it's generally going to be a business. If you're if you get a little bit of money from a hobby, but you have way more expenses than income, 
you can see what the iris is going to do they're going to say i don't want you to record it as a business because you're going to have a loss and you're going to write the loss off against other income no we want you to record that as a hobby so that any income you get we want a piece of it but we don't want to take on your losses <laughs> right that would be a, so the the facts and circumstances of each case determine whether or not an activity is a trade or business so you do not need to actually make a profit or be in a trade or business as long as you have a profit motive so that's the other side of the coin remember that if you are in business for profit it's likely that you do have a loss maybe for the first couple of years that's what often happens for small businesses and and a lot of small businesses go under that's just the way it works because that's that's entrepreneurship that's risk taking and whatnot so the fact that you have a loss if you have a profit goal don't be afraid of reporting a loss but if it's a hobby then it's not a for-profit business okay so you so you do need to make ongoing efforts to further the interests of your business so if the irs was to audit you or something like that you'd have to prove to them hey look yeah i was in it for business here i missed i may not don't be embarrassed that you that it failed a lot of businesses fail and that's fine but i wrote it off legitimately here because i was trying to make money on it so and an LLC is an entity formed under state law by filing articles of organization. Now, whenever we have a sole proprietorship business, you've got different kinds of structural entities that then could come up, which could be supportive or helpful for multiple reasons, including possibly liability protection, for example. Uh, it used to be that you had the corporation, which was a separate legal entity, and then they came up with all these kind of flow through entities like a limited liability company. Uh, which if it was a single member, then it could be still treated as a Schedule C in some cases, possibly. And then like a partnership and an and a, and a S corporation and whatnot. So generally the income tax purpose is a, so here we have a single member LLC is disregarded as an entity separate from its owner and reports its income and deductions on its own federal income tax return. So you got to be kind of careful with those those limited liability companies because the the laws may be different from state to state and and uh if you're single member llc you're trying to get that liability protection oftentimes uh, but then there's questions as to whether how 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 much liability protection you're getting from a single member llc but you might still be able to report it as a uh, on a schedule c for for which will make it easy for tax reporting purposes in essence. So for example, if a single member LLC is not engaged in farming and the owner of an entity, they may use Schedule C. Okay, so we have a sole proprietor. A sole proprietor is someone who owns an unincorporated business by themselves. So in other words, if it was incorporated, then it would be a corporation. It would be a separate legal entity. Now there's different kinds of corporations. You could have a, a sole proprietor I mean, I'm sorry, you can have a C corporation versus an S corporation, but the idea is that it would be a, like a separate legal entity. Now, if you had one person that just started doing business, you started up a hot dog stand or something like that, obviously you didn't incorporate it. You didn't do the paperwork to make it a separate legal entity. You started making money and the IRS wants a piece of your hot dog stand. That's all it takes from the IRS perspective. You can get into other things. You could say, well, don't I need a business license? Don't I need this and that? Yeah, you, you probably do. Do I need to get a check to make sure I don't have moldy hot dogs in my state or something like that because I'm selling food or something? Yeah, you got to deal with all those codes as well. But from the income tax perspective, even if you were selling drugs or something, that, which is illegal, the IRS still wants their piece if you were to sell it. If you were to sell the drugs, right? You could, they would still, so all from the federal tax perspective, and if you just start doing business, then you're going to be a sole proprietor. Now, the tricky thing is that if a partnership just started doing business, then they would technically be a partnership, right? So if two people sort of the hot dog stand, it's a partnership. The problem with a partnership is that it becomes more difficult to kind of uh, determine who gets allocated the income. Normally you would have a separate return a partnership income tax return that would then flow into the individual tax returns so be careful if you're a sole proprietorship and you want to grow do you want to take on partners or do you want to hire contractors or employees if you take on partners then you do lose some of your control over the business and the partners decisions 
are are decisions that you could be held liable for <laughs> so so possibly in a partnership where so any case you are also a sole proprietor for income tax purpose if you are an individual and the sole member of a domestic llc unless you elect to have the llc treated as a corporation so another like single member llc situation independent contractor People such as doctors, dentists, veterinarians, lawyers, accountants, contractors, subcontractors, public uh, stenographers, and uh, auctioneers who are in an independent trade, business, or profession in which they offer their services to the general public are generally independent contractors. However, whether they are independent contractors or employees depends on the facts of each case. So in other words, if you're in one of these areas, oftentimes you might think of yourself you might be able to situate yourself as an independent contractor or an employee. And the line between those two is not as clear. Obviously, if you have to be somewhere from nine to five and someone's telling you exactly what to do from nine to five, then you're basically gonna be an employee. The IRS will try to, if the IRS came in and audits you, they would say you're an employee. And the IRS typically wants people in an employee employer situation because remember they have the leverage over the employer forcing the employer not only to report the income they're given to the employee but make them their tax collector so so that doesn't mean so so that's kind of you would think that the IRS is angling in that direction so if they were to to try to audit someone as to whether they're a contractor or an employee the IRS is going for forcing someone to be an employee most of the time right because the IRS has more control in that format. Uh, but the rules aren't always that clear cut. So you might, if you use your own tools, your own computer, you have your own hours, you work from another location and so on and so forth, you might be a contractor. So also realize that when you talk to the IRS, they're gonna frame it as though being an employee is better than being a contractor. And th it's not necessarily cut and dry like that because it could there are benefits you might get benefits as an employee and it might be more stable uh, uh and you have a tax benefit and that you're not paying the employer side of the payroll tax basically the self-employment tax when you're a sole proprietor then you have your own business you got to pay self-employment tax which is the equivalent of of social security and medicare but you have to pay the employer and employee portion however you also get to deduct your expenses, so which could be huge, could bring down your net income a lot, and of course, now you're not you're not subject to the whims of your employer. You can do more whatever you want. So there's pros and cons to the two situations, but remember that the IRS, as we'll probably we'll, we'll see going through with this, will kind of tend toward they're the good guy by forcing the, you into a situation where you're an employee employer situation. That's not a bad situation necessarily, but it's one where the, the IRS feels more comfortable because they have more control. So the general rule is that an individual is an independent contractor if the person paying uh, for the work has the right to control or to direct only the result of the work and not how it will be done. So that's the general rule to determine if you're a contractor or an employee. Once you've determined which you, you are, you wanna make sure that you can can prove that to the, to the government that you are a contractor versus an employee if that's the situation you're in. So the earnings of a person who is working as an independent contractor are subject to self-employment tax. For more information on determining whether you are an employee or independent contractor, you can see publication 15A, Employer Supplemental Tax Guide. So are you a statutory employee? A statutory employee has a check mark in box 13 of their form W-2 wage and tax statement. Statutory employees use Schedule C to report their wages and expenses. So now you're in a weird kind of situation there, which is somewhat more unusual situation where you're kind of a, a, a W-2 employee. So you're getting kind of benefits as an employee, but you also have this situation where you can use the Schedule C to report uh, report their wages and expenses. So you might be able to get uh, expenses in that case uh, as well, even though most W-2 employees don't get to deduct, you know, their expenses because the idea would be that the employer is taking care of the expenses. Whereas if you're a contractor, that's one of the benefits to being a contractor, you get to deduct your expenses.